This building begins here where we're standing and continues past that exit. It's at least 20,000 square feet. And there are eight ritual baths in this house. Here is a mikveh, a ritual bath to use as you're entering the house. We come into a glorious foyer. Much of the stucco on this walls is original stucco. And you can see here how this room looked. We actually have these doorways and pieces of the roof. This is not a guess. This is exact. It's a very wealthy family. Eight ritual baths. Why so many ritual baths? My suggestion is everybody is eating on a daily basis foods that require the body being pure. And your furniture has to be pure. And your clothing has to be pure. And your metal dishes have to be purified. And if I'm wealthy, I have a mikvah by those bedrooms, by the dining room, by where the workers work. Let's look at this building. This is not even a complete mock-up of this house. This is just a taste. And in a moment, we will enter this courtyard. But look at the many rooms over here. Again, eight ritual baths. There are most cities of the world don't have eight mikvahs, even with great communities. So this is a house with a view that overlooks the Temple Mount. From this house, you would see the Temple Mount, the Mount of Olives, the lower city of David. What a glorious place to live. Look at the beauty of these dishes. That's a sign of wealth. They're not simply functional. And then in this dish, there is a break in the middle. It has been tested in the lab. It was done after the vessel was made. It wasn't made for that. And Rav Asher Grosbart says this must have to do with purifying clay cheris, with purifying pottery. Ah, there's a concern here for purity. We see that here with these stone dishes and stone vessels. And when you make those cups, pieces come out which are then used as weights, which Professor Ronnie Reich says, normally weights are used with lead. The stone weights are a sign of the Jewish concern for Tara. Here is what Professor Nachman Avigad called a foot bath. And Revas Raglaim, Rabbi Yaakov Weinberg Zetzel said, yes, that's probably the, the Revas Raglaim mentioned in the Mishnah. And here you see stone tables, overwhelming concern for purity because stone does not become defiled. Clay Evan, a namitami. This house is so grand, and location, 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 where it is. And the fact that we found two stones that say Bar Katros, which is the name of the family of high priests of Kohanim Gedolim mentioned in the Talmud, suggests that this is the home of a Kohen Gadol. This neighborhood was destroyed by the Romans. On Tisha B'Av, the temple was destroyed, and Josephus tells us that this city was burned on the eighth day of El. What a grand house. According to one opinion in the Mishnah Bura, you have to make the brach of Baruch Daina Emes if you have, blessed be the true judge of mourning if you haven't been in this house. The grandeur, the wealth, but this is the neighborhood in which an event happens that we always learn on Tisha B'Av. Says the Gemara in Gim, Amar Reb Yochanan, Bay Dachsiv Ashrei Adam Mefachet Tamid, what does it mean that a person should always be concerned? If he hardens his heart, he will fall in evil. If you don't consider the consequences of your action, what is the worst case? And Akamso Bar Yushalayim is the first example. On that little difference between Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, Jerusalem is destroyed. And so the wrong person is invited to a fancy meal, and Bar Kamsa goes to engineer the destruction, and they say, no, we can't kill him, because what will people say? But what happens if there won't be a Jerusalem and there won't be a temple? What are the consequences? What is the context of our actions? What's really going on? Are we ultimately concerned? Are we ultimately responsible? On these little things you shall I fell, we have to consider and we have to think. There's no doubt, absolutely no doubt, that this is the neighborhood and the type of home in which that fancy meal, when Bar Kamsa was thrown out, took place. We're in that scene. We don't want to make that mistake again. Hi, this is Benny Friedman speaking to you from Gush Etzion. I wanted to share with you a quick thought. We're getting deeper into the three weeks. Today is the 23rd of Tammuz. We're leading up to Tisha B'Av, the anniversary of the destruction of the temple. 
Chazal tell us that the second Beit Midash was destroyed because of Sinat Chinam. What does that mean? What does it mean to have hatred for no reason? You can't hate somebody for no reason. So the Nitziv, the Tali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, the Rosh Hashiva Valajan, in his commentary on the Torah, Haim Akdavar, has a page of introduction before the first book of the Torah, before Sefer Breshit. And he asks a very simple question. Why is this book called Sefer HaYashar? The book of the upright, the book of those who are straight and true. Avram Avinu, Yitzchak, Yaakov, the role models of the book of Genesis, they were righteous, they were tzaddikim, they were pious, they were chassidim. Why specifically are they noted for being Yisharim? Says the Nitziv, because even though they were righteous and they were pious, what God really loved about them was that they were Yisharim. Avram Avinu, whose life was spent fighting idolatry, attempting to spread monotheism in the world, nonetheless, in the way he dealt with idolaters, who were the antithesis of everything he believed in. I know the way he treated even idolaters, our forefathers treated them with love, with respect. He asks, how could it be that the period of the Second Temple, which included Torah giants, the Tanaim, the authors of the Mishnah, Rav Yochanan ben Zakkai, Rabbi Shmuel, Rabbi Gamliel, how could the Temple be destroyed during the period of such giants? Because he says, even though they were righteous, and even though they toiled in Torah, they weren't straight. They didn't treat those around them who had differing opinions the way God wants us to treat our fellow human beings. He defines sinat chinam, unnecessary hatred, as hating someone because their path to a relationship with God was different from theirs. If I hate someone because the way they relate to God is different from mine, that's sinat chinam. Now don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean you have to agree with them. Before you can disagree with someone, you have to respect where they're coming from. Once you respect where they're coming from, then you can disagree with them. But if you hate them, that's sinat chinam. So how do we fix that? We learn to respect people for their different opinions, even though we vehemently disagree with them. We love them, despite the fact that we think they're wrong. If we could all feel that way about each other, we'd live in a different world. You hear at sun that one day soon, we'll all walk in through the gates of the old city, up to Harabait, to the Temple Mount, to see the rebuilding of the temple, to see the offerings come back, and everything else that we dream of, but most of all, a place where Jews can put aside their differences, where there's no section for the Reform and the Orthodox and the Conservative and the Conservatox and the Reconstructionists. We just all get to be together in the service of Hashem. Wishing us all peace soon.